everybody, Greg Poole here at Bojunkie Media, bojunkiemedia.com. We're here in Denver, Colorado. Technically, we're in the, the suburbs of Denver. We're here at Kafaro International. They make packs, jackets, sleeping bags, tents, tarps, little stove ovens. It's amazing the stuff that they make. 100% made in America, sourced in America. And so we're, we're going to go in here and talk with our good friend Aaron Snyder. Aaron's going to kind of walk us through some of the Kafaru products and then we're going to take a walk through the factory and uh, kind of watch how all of this goes together. So stay tuned. We're about to Kafaru it up. All right, everybody, we're here inside Kafaru International. We're here with Aaron Snyder. Aaron, what is what exactly is your title and kind of what do you do here at Kafaru? Well, I'm a man of many hats, I guess. Uh, <laughs> marketing, design, and R&D is my, my primary job. So I do all the, well, Eric Bender and I do all the design, and then I go out, test it. As you see all the adventures I go on, right. I take photos of it while I test it. We use those photos for marketing. Uh, and then I come back in here and edit photos, break more gear and run back out and test it again. I, I do, I could, I could be cleaning a bathroom one day, I guess too, as far as, it's a small company, but uh, those are my primary jobs. All right, and so kind of give everybody out, out there that doesn't necessarily uh, understand how Kafaru came to be or know the history of Kafaru, kind of explain, explain to us briefly kind of how it got started and uh, you know how it's positioned now. Okay, well it, in uh, the 70s, Patrick Smith, who owns Kafaru, he, he and his wife Sarah Smith started Mountain Smith, a backpacking company. Those were sold REI, different mountaineering stores. He sold that later on. Uh, that company, uh, after he sold it, he wanted to go to a uh, basically a Barry Compliant, all-American made company, uh, and he started Kafaru. Barry Compliant, what, what exactly is that? Basically everything um, that we sell is made in America with 100% American made components. So you'll see a lot of companies slap an American flag on a pack or a product that all of the parts, pieces, and components are from Asia but it's put together in America. Here, everything, okay. for the most part, is made in this building with all American-made parts and components. And that's what very compliancy basically means. Okay, so so for a layman like myself, what is the difference between Barry, is, is that B-A-R-R-Y? -R -R yeah, I, I think so, yeah, B-A-R-R-Y. -R -R yeah. Okay, so so what's the difference between what someone will call Barry compliant and what you just referenced as potentially made in America? Um, well, you can, the, it's a great difference. One, we're, we're basically not, we have to produce all the paperwork when we sell to the government that everything from the needles to the thread on up that we used is from the U.S. Wow. Compared to what the outgo, you know, uh, one of our competitors has an American flag just like ours on the backpack, but 100% of that pack is from overseas. It's just put together here. So, Big so difference. okay, so very compliant means you have to get every single thing that's involved in the manufacturing of it here, whereas technically made in America, you can buy it from overseas as long as it's put together here. Yeah, I, I mean, there's no, uh, I don't even think there's rules for that. I mean, you, there's okay. some, I mean, I don't know. I know some companies that strap an American flag on, a, on, on some of the outdoor products that, other than shipped out the door in right. the United States, there's nothing. <laughs> yeah, for us, the labor, the parts, the material components, everything's uh, from the United States. Nice. So. And so um, how has the company uh, kind of grown, not, not just in market share, but in, in how the company is, is structured from uh, back when the family started it to now? It's a lot bigger now. Um, it... Um, it's kind of changed in the uh, on, on the, the the sales uh, when I started tactically we were a lot bigger but largest drawdown in history oh that's changing now that Trump's in office but sure. largest drawdown in history so we started focusing a lot of our efforts on on hunting okay um, shelters and so we're significantly bigger than we were four or five years ago or Kafaro's ever been now um, but we uh, some headache involved in that too, sure. right? Hard to keep the wheels, sure. the train on the tracks, but we're definitely quite a bit bigger than we were. So. Okay, and so uh, how long have you been involved with the company itself? I, I guess about, um, I've worked here 
in one way, shape, or form for five years. Okay. Um, I started off working basically for free, and then I worked for, uh, uh, I was uh, like a subcontractor, and then, you know, full-time or whatever. But six years total, but five years where I've actually, I guess, been paid. So. Okay, and <laughs> how many of the of the family that started this, the the, uh, the original, how, how many of them are still around or their kids? So, well, Patrick and Sarah are still here. Patrick's kind of retired, and I've kind of taken his... Uh, position in some ways and then Sarah she still works off and on in and out uh, but her daughters uh, or their daughters work here the the oldest daughter Lisa does she's in charge of production um, the second to oldest is Allie she's behind me here uh, in this room she's in charge of QC shipping uh, things like that basically and then um, the youngest daughter uh, doesn't work her year, but her husband does okay he's like IT and uh, orders a lot of raw goods and then the oldest daughter's daughter, <laughs> okay. Mackenzie, she helps out with production, uh, ordering parts, components, things like that. It's very tight knit. I don't need to keep going. So, but so it's definitely a family affair. Yeah, definitely a family affair. That's exactly right. Awesome. <laughs> so. All right. So kind of walk us through um, some of the pack offerings. Obviously, you guys, there, there's lots of videos out there on Kafaru's website. Aaron does a lot of stuff. You can check YouTube. I mean, there's there there's a lot of, of content on how to properly use the packs, but just kind of, kind of give us a brief overview of, you know, your mainline offerings. Yeah, this will be a real down and dirty because we offer way too much stuff. But like this pack right here, we just came out with this recently. This is a quandary is what it's called. It's named after a 14er. It's really like a, a runner's pack for climbing 14 or just a day pack holds a water bladder. And then, you know, you shift down to this one. Um, Kathy, your wife behind the camera could get inside this and I could pack her around. This thing's a giant. <laughs> um, we can get this thing over 10,000 cubic inches. Um, based, a lot of guides and outfitters use this. And, and then everything in the middle between there. So we go from basically 1,100 cubic inches all the way up to where we're pumping over 10,000 cubic inches in size. We have internal frames, uh, meaning just, you know, very simplistic uh, frame. And then we have multiple external frames. And then we have all kinds of escape and evade bags, pockets, components. I could talk for the next hour on the amount of stuff we Speaking order. Of, let's so. go over here and take a gander. I see that, that oh, over here you have uh, lots of accessories, pockets. Um, and so kind of walk us through some of your options here. I have, I have the, the 14er that most of you see me using at the ASA events, um, anywhere that I'm walking around. Um, I'm rolling the 14er with several of the accessory pockets on there. So go ahead and walk us through these. Well, I have to say, believe it or not, this is slimmed down significantly from when I started. One of the things when we started, we cut like 80% of the pockets and it was a, it was a nightmare. But these are the big ones. So these are our five string compression strack, stra uh, compression sacks. And with these, the, the idea being they compress this way instead of this way so it doesn't become a big ball in your pack and you don't lose as much space. Uh, so it ends up like stacking logs inside. These are our belt pouches here, obviously a bunch of hats. These are lock and load pockets. All these work in continuity with different systems of packs that we have. Sure. These are our pullouts, which are like little ditty bags. We make them out of ultralight material, cold Cordura and uh, mesh sacks. Uh, these are organizer pockets. This is a tombstone. It's for kind of concealing a pistol. Uh, this is, there's a pile of different, uh, this isn't even all of them, sure. but these all work in continuity. Everything we do has a science behind the system, meaning like the, the mega pullout, which I can fit five days of food in here. This fits almost perfectly the circum circumference of all of our bags. So when lo you're loading up your pack, you put your sleeping bag on the bottom. You want your heaviest weight kind of mid back. And then this fits perfectly on top of that gotcha. to suspend it. So we try to use some common sense from all of our field use and what we design so it all works hand in hand with each other. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's go down and check out some of your uh, floorless shelters down here. And for, for those of you that, that might actually be uh, thinking about perusing before we get to that, Kafaru also makes uh, amazing sleeping bags, coats. Go ahead and tell us about this coat right here real quick. Uh, this jacket is... Um, I will say out of the gate, it's not the coolest looking jacket. Um, that was one of the, when we came out with it, we kind of had to just um, say, hey, it does what it does. And if people want to stay alive, they'll get this jacket. It's not Abercrombie and Fitch or whatever. It's not, but right. it, 
it's like wearing a sleeping bag. Basically, it's so warm. It's a continuous fiber filament, so there's no stitch holes to hold the baffling in place, so you don't lose heat from that. We've got Cordura on the stomach and on the elbows and uh, forearms as well for low crawling. It's got a hood that you can zip off. On the inside here, there's actually, um, well, you won't see it, but there's uh, slot pockets to hold hot hands, those uh, oh, nice. hand warmers that are inside here. Absolutely. So yeah, it's, this is a giant one. We were hoping this would fit Greg and we, we failed. Uh, <laughs> it didn't quite fit him, but uh, this one, it was close. We tried. Uh, <laughs> you bet. So go ahead and talk to us a little bit about the uh, sh shelters yep. here. So which, I mean, let's be honest, that's probably one of the most important things you take out into the woods, I would think. It, it is, and this is what uh, Brian and I spent most of the season in last year on our hunts. This is called the Tut. It's more of a pyramid design. Um, this this is, I'd say, proprietary material. Um, it, it's, uh, how to explain this? Most uh, like 30D ripstop sill nylon material is, is basically mass produced in Asia. Um, there is some American made. What makes ours different, it's a, there's a super high tech, high tenacity mill spec sill nylon. It's basically when they make the soup that makes the threads, the threads are longer. That's mm -hmm. the big difference. It's also dual coated, so it lasts longer as far as waterproofing. It's more UV resistant. But all of our, all of our uh, shelters are made of this. This is the tut, and we made this for, uh, get in here for two giant people like Greg and myself to be able to fit in. You can kind of stand up inside. You can fit a stove in here. There's a stove jack. This is actually the bull I shot this year. And <laughs> nice. you can fit three people in here, but the idea is one person, two person, stove, all your gear, plenty of room. So, sure. And we, we offer everything from a flat tarp up to a 24 man teepee. Um, and that thing's big. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, Absolutely. and everything in between. The one back there is a sawtooth, same material. It's just a different design. And uh, and as far as the jackets go, the sleeping bag is made out of the same material as the jackets. And we try to basically just use the highest quality, best parts and pieces we can to to keep people alive and comfortable in the field. So. Absolutely. And so, the the first question that I have about this is wind. Yeah. Um, I know you and I have had the discussion before on how when you guys come out with something new like this, you will go find the w windiest peak you can and go stay up there for a couple of days and test things out. So yeah. what do you say to a customer, assuming that they ask, yeah. when they call in and go, hey, I'm going to be going here, um, expecting 40 mile an hour winds? Oh, and we get that every day, all day. Okay. So, <laughs> and when we offer different shelters to do different things, um, the sawtooth, which is in the back, that handles much higher wind. Um, it's a little bit heavier than the tut, but that handles higher wind better. This though is easier to set up. It takes up less room, it's lighter weight. And so we're like, hey, are you hunting elk and you're in the trees, you're never by tree line, you need it fast pitch. This goes up tw two or three times faster than that one. We'll say, hey, take the sawtooth. Oh, you're hunting a fourth season mule deer tag. It's going to be snowing. Yeah, get the sawtooth. You don't. We don't want the tut. And right. so, whether they ask or not, we ask them. We sure. make sure that we get them the right parts and pieces and products because the last thing we want is someone pissed off that they froze to death. So. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So we're going to uh, we're going to head back and check out some of the manufacturing facilities. Take a look at some of the sleeping bags and the other things they have in back, and kind of see how things flow here at Kafaru International. everybody we're here in the cutting room in the back of Kafaru we're gonna let Aaron kind of explain what's going on back here well I don't uh, I really have nothing to do with being back here except when I come to Lisa and ask her a question and she tells I'm in a hurry hurry up no, I'm just kidding so what do you do exactly back here well we lay out the patterns cut the, the fabric for all the pack sleeping bags sleds all of it so basically everything because i was trying to go over berry compliancy all the fabric gets laid out here stacked up she traces the patterns on it she cuts them out that goes in a bag rachel batches it who's another lady that works here that goes to sewers so or sew it bring it back to you you check it back in that goes to daughter number two Allie, or the second oldest daughter who then they put it together and ship it out the door that's the, the long and short of it and you've been here uh 11 years 11 years and you worked you were how old were you when Mountain Smith was going on? 14. And 14. then I worked there for 13 years. Yeah. Wow. So, so how many 
combined, not not like per pack or per seating bag, but how many patterns um, do you cut per day? Oh, Lord. Um, possibly as many as 10 a day, sometimes 70 high. Oh, okay. So so how, how many uh, units, I guess you would say, as far as like, so you stack the material up 70 deep. Mm -hmm. And so, and so how many different units per se, like if you were cutting uh, sleeping bags and packs and stuff in one day for the pattern, it's how many belt pouches, how yeah, many, belt how many pouches? individual? It could be hundreds. Yeah. Cause we can also not just do single, but we could do doubles and triples from the CAD program. So wow. when we come up with a pack that um, has like the worst thing she ever wants to hear is five layups, meaning Bender and I have screwed it up on the design so bad there's five different part pieces to it or materials. Materials. Because she has to lay out five different times and then trace things five different times, which it's important to know that ahead of time because I won't even approach her with a five layup pattern or pack anymore because there's no need. There's, there, from what I've seen in, in the design and use of it, and, and it makes your life a living hell. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. prefer doing easier ones. <laughs> All right. So, so speaking of, what's the what is the most difficult uh, uh, unit that you have to cut out right now that's in production? Probably the anteros and the tombstones. They're little, and I don't like them. Yeah. They're four and, layups, I believe. And the one thing that she and I have been able to do on this side of of things is. And I, you can chime in any time as I talk to her as we're designing so she can tell me ahead of time if it's an epic pain and I can shift from there to make everyone's life easier in the, the long run, I guess would be the easiest way to explain it. So um, the, the KU packs, at yeah. what level of a pain would you put that? Almost wanting to quit. Yeah. So a family business. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's funny because people will call me, why'd you kill the KU pack? Well, we'd have to cut 25 to get 20 good ones. Um, they were um, they, you know, they weren't they were a two pound 5,000 cubic inch pack. They were not going to be overly durable, right? You got to pay. Someone gets paid, hard to warranty or or fix and repair. Um, and literally, I yeah, I'd almost seen you in tears trying yeah. to get them to cut. So sometimes you got to shoot a hostage, right? And right. that was the hostage. It was going down and took two in the head. Like it was a pain, and I don't think. Well, I know we, you'll never, if I think if I approached her with it, she'd kick me in the ding ding. Like I will, will never build a KU pack out of that material. Cause when you stack it, mm -hmm. it's like whale snot stacked multiple times. And then you're trying to make all these cuts and it, it it's horrible. So yeah. I agree. yeah. <laughs> and so, um, in this particular, um, I, I will assume, correct me if I'm wrong, as far as the totality of Kafaru, but how many days a week? are you guys uh, running the cutting room itself? Every day, every day. Yeah, all day, every day, except in the morning when you're counting, right? I guess you, she does a lot of computer stuff on inventory. Well, yeah, so, I check yeah. stock versus orders, so I know what we need to make. Or when Bojunkie brings in muffins. Yeah. <laughs> you brought the muffins today? She brought the muffins today. Thank you. Yeah. That was fun. Awesome, well, great meeting you and keep up the good work. All right, we're in back of Kafaru right now where the magic happens. This is assembly, <laughs> quality control, shipping, the whole nine yards happens back here. So uh, go ahead and kind of talk us through uh, what's going on back here, Aaron. Well, this is Allie's department and- uh, Hey everyone. Yes, <laughs> this is this is another one of Patrick's daughters and you, you've been here longer than anybody. I've been here, yeah, six, Seven. 16, almost 17 years. Nice. Coming up in August. <laughs> yeah, yeah, long, long time. And she's in charge of, like you said, shipping, QC, assembly and multiple other different things. We all wear many hats. You have the biggest department. Mm, um, yeah, and, uh, the hottest department. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there's fans going everywhere. But basically, um, all the packs get uh, delivered to us here, and then you and your guys put them together and QC them, and then we you do. ship them out the door. We ship them out. Yeah, so I like, go- to about 100 a day. Yeah, which is in, insane. Insane. There's, yeah. You can't see behind Kathy, but there's boxes piled up that are getting shipped out today behind her. Um, and, and what these are here are, are basically just um, the, the assembly areas. Over there, what that's, uh, who works in that department? Adrian. Who's it? Adrian, but no, there's Jordan. We have Adrian, Jordan, Mike, Dave. Cody. Cody. Dominic. Dominic, Amy. Amy Katie, Kaylee. Mary. 
Carrie. Alex. I'm glad Big you're Mike. here because I couldn't remember them all. Yeah, I got Big Everybody. Mike. And, and some of the guys are in charge of, guys and gals are in charge of big packs, some pockets, some shelters. Um, Amy, who I speak with frequently, she does all shelters right now, right? Yeah. So, so what exactly do they do over there in the corner over there with the, with the giant bottle of sriracha on the table? So, yeah. They all disappeared when they saw the camera come through. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, big you packs. Into it? What, what David's doing here. Yep. Same thing. He can show you guys, but uh, they're putting together big packs. All, all the, the customers' measurements and specifications and what they wanted on their order. And all those little containers hold the parts and pieces is, mm -hmm. is what those are for. So all the different buckles and everything mm -hmm. else. Absolutely. So let me ask you as, you know, as pretty much part of the, of the legacy mm -hmm. of, of the family business, um, kind of give us your, uh, you know your personal perspective having been here since ever um of where the company you know kind of was okay. and where it is now well there was three of us when i first started and it was temporary i was going to help the family out and finish school and now 17 years later i'm here and there's a lot more than three of us <laughs> kind of <laughs> right. drew me in and i'm really proud of how it's grown and what we've accomplished and i just couldn't leave how do you leave something you love <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And so as you know, being a family business like that, those are becoming family businesses are becoming fewer and fewer in this day and age. Um, what does it mean, you know, to you as you know, this is your family business um, and you now have this guy out there, uh, you know, kind of pushing your guys' agenda, which uh, is is more, more than working. Uh, it's obviously a recipe for success. So from the family aspect of it, what does it mean to you to have the longevity of the business you have and see it all coming together? Oh, gosh, it's awesome. I'm proud of it. I, I feel secure. It's like security. It's, it makes me happy that we can employ all these guys and give them security and hopefully a nice place to work. Um, we want people to enjoy coming here. I enjoy it, and I think these guys do too. And it's really nice when you're out somewhere and someone sees a Kifaru shirt or they ask you questions and you can be proud of what you do and what you've accomplished. So it just makes me proud. <laughs> awesome. That's, that's great. So what do we got going on right over here? Ooh, here. We are matching <laughs> lots of orders with what they've ordered and trying to push it out this way and then out the door. <laughs> nice. So, so everything kind, kind of works. It sort of flows. There we and go. It gets really messy in here, so I apologize for that. Um, and we're just busy. We need to expand. And we're going through this fall. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Let's uh, let's go around the corner and see what's going on over there. All right. So we just came from part of assembly over there. We're kind of turn in the corner in the in the process here. So Aaron, go ahead and explain what's what's kind of happening behind us, and then we'll kind of move down the final stages right here. Well, this this is Jordan and Big Mike, and they're putting together frames right now. Um, they take the dimensions that are on the paperwork, the, the height, the weight, and everything else of the guys. They're adjusting it to those dimensions, uh, you know, putting the bags on. And then that, as you shuffle down, the parts, like the pockets, things like that, go on down here. So we so, head over there. So yeah. when, when people, be, before we move down there, so, so these are not the kind of packs where you just go into this, you just could be like, yep, that one, and you just ordered, it, and it's one size fits all. The, how many of the Kafaru packs are basically... Uh, built to order by the size of the of, of the human uh, all of them except the really small ones right okay. Th those don't you know like you will adjust the shoulder straps if you're tall but okay. where you really get the benefit um, of the pack is all our framed packs 14ers uh, terry alls and that's in the case like go ahead whack it no, one more good, time dude. mike yeah <laughs> so let me see that mike so mike's pounding in these stays and these stays are curved to the back profile of the user Oh, okay. And so, and then the shoulder straps, Mike will adjust that or Jordan or whoever to the length uh, or the height. In your case, you're a monster. So you would get a 28 inch frame. The gotcha. shoulder straps will be extended more and you'd have a bigger belt than the other person. So, gotcha. gotcha. And those, the belts are made upstairs to the size that Absolutely. we get. Absolutely. And then coming on down here. You're up, no, I'm not here today. <laughs> so this is Amy. And Amy, you do pretty much all shelters now, don't you? Yeah. So, what do you look for on the shelters when you're QCing them? Oh God. <laughs> no, no, no pressure. No one's watching yet. Ever. Um, basically, you just. Can't, and I really don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to talk for you? <laughs> no, yeah, you can talk. Oh, oh Lord. Lord. All right, Aaron, you're up. All right, swap spots. 
<laughs> so uh, Amy, she does all the different shelters, and you've <laughs> taken that over that from, from Allie, because Allie's busy doing other stuff. Allie, who's, you used to do all the shelters, uh -huh. right? Well, the shelter sales have gotten more and more, so she is extremely, this is bow junkie, anal retentive. She is very anal, so she's in my office all the time showing me discrepancies in the shelters before we send them out to the, the customer. Sure. Um, she also, you put all the stakes and all everything else together, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's pretty much what you do all day, right? Just shelters? Yep. Yeah. She's yeah. the shelter queen. Yes, there exactly. You go. So. And she's and the redness is going away, so that's, <laughs> that's a good thing. All right, oh, what's Lord. our last st station down here? So over here, this is basically accessories. Um, we have a few people that work in accessories, but the pockets, cargo panels, cargo nets, uh, belt pouches, things like that, those all get assembled in this area here. And that's kind of the last portion before it goes out the door. And then as you piles of boxes behind this, getting ready right. to get picked up by UPS. Absolutely. And so start to finish, not like if you were to shut down everything and just do one, but start to finish on a regular production day. How long does it take once the order is approved as far as there's all the necessary parts and pieces are here? How long does it take to, to go through the process, the cutting room, to everything else we've seen so far? I have no idea. Allie? <laughs> I, 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 would, I would say, yeah, a belt pouch would be relatively quickly. I mean, cut to ship a week. Yeah. Okay. Cut, sew, ship. Pack, cut, sewing takes a little longer. Okay. Two weeks. And so, I, so, so a week for the smaller stuff, two weeks for the, for the larger stuff. As it, as it goes within the flow of the production. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, just out of curiosity, since I put in the caveat there from the beginning, if you were to shut down the factory and make one pack, let's say a 14er, and you were to say, one, two, three, go, and that's all everybody was waiting to do, one pack, how long would it take you guys to make one pack? If everyone oh, was from, waiting to do their from job. From the cut and sew portion? Yes. Probably two and a half weeks. Oh, no, like one pack. Like no, like one well, pack. They sewed it upstairs, they came down here, we put it together. I was it, we could get it out. If they sewed it upstairs. Yeah, oh yeah, upstairs. you could definitely do it in a day. Okay. Um, I guess I want to make sure that people understand this. Yeah, th it that's is not when you order. <laughs> when you order, it's not a day. I'm just it's asking from, from the standpoint of if, the, if they weren't doing normal production, just how long it takes to make up like a 14 or so. She's saying that- A if, sewer could sew it in, a, in four hours okay and then they could assemble it in 30 minutes 40 gotcha. minutes okay. what what happens is is when people want us to build one off <laughs> because right. she's stacking 70 deep back there she has to lay out one cut one send it to one sewer they sew one build one right and it's a very very it's a good way to go out of business building sure, one absolutely offs. but yeah it doesn't it's not that bad to do just one um we just don't make any we, don't, we won't ever make any money if well, we sure. build just one sure so. absolutely so um, when it comes to the, the production run schedule and how busy you guys are, obviously right now uh, we're coming up on July here in not very long. Um, is this your guys' stock up busy season before hunting season starts or w what time of year is this for you right now in, in your overall? This is uh, the busiest time of the year right now. Okay. Um, and, uh, so I picked the best time to come interrupt everybody. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it only gets worse until September, then it slows down a little bit, and then we go to show season, Christmas, it gets busy again. But right now, you know, May, June, July, and August are, are insane, so. Awesome. So, and actually, Alex, come back. So, Alex. <laughs> Here's Alex. So there's. Come on, so, Alex, right here in the middle. Da David. I feel really short. <laughs> David in the first portion, he's kind of in charge of over there, Assembly Big Mike over here, he's kind of with the big packs, and then Alex, your accessories, and Amy was teepees, so. Yep. You pump out pockets all day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, all the little stuff, and then uh, sleeping bags and parkas, woobies, um, and then all the belt pouches, gun bearers, all the small stuff like that too. And so, luckily, he has OCD, and so does Amy because they're very, very meticulous on the sure. QC portion of it. So I would say, uh, what would you say on average? How many? How many pockets? bags, pocket, you know, what are you shipping out to each day? Um, probably on an average day, we're doing about maybe 50, 60 orders a day. Yeah. I'd yeah. say. And we'll, Something I think about like that. Getting closer Just to 100. Just accessories wise. Yeah. 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 Kind of 
but yeah, it's just getting busier and busier. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, good job. Cool. Keep up the good work, and uh, we're gonna head next door and check out some of the uh, some of the units that keep you warm on those long mountain nights. Yeah. So, here we go. All right. So we're here at the Kafaru Metal Shop. This is where um, all the all the steaks, all the ovens, all of that stuff's kind of put put together. So uh, kind of walk us through the process here. I mean, these these little ovens that you guys make, besides Wayne, virtually nothing. Uh, kind of an important piece of equipment. It it is, and it's um, it it it's been copied by numerous people now. But it's it's amazing knowing the history. Patrick started it all, right? When and I when I mean it all, you saw upstairs. Yes. We have stoves from the 70s and 80s, but right. there's, um, there's, there's basically, there's a, we have a cylinder stove, a circular you know, tube looking stove, and we have a box stove. Uh, this is what it looks like when it's all done going out the door. This is uh, a big, this is a big boy. This is for a 16 man teepee. Okay. Um, and then this. That little, that bag is a stove for a 16 man teepee? Yep, yep. And so and you, wow. as, if you can imagine, it's, it's this long and it's this wide, and then it's about that deep. And then the stovepipe, everybody always wonders, how do you get the stovepipe to fit? Well, you, it's the circumference. That's how wide it is, and you roll up the stovepipe. Gotcha. So that's how it gets to be so compact. And then this is the cylinder stove here, and this is for a sawtooth. And it, this is actually only, I think it's one pound, 13 ounces. Wow. Um, and it, um, yeah, it keeps you alive. I mean, you can you know, get it 80 degrees in there if you want when it's 20 outside. Right. Um, and so what material am I looking at here as far as the as the pipe part goes. So like right here, this is the barrel. This is 4K titanium. Uh, and that's the titanium. Belly. Yep, titanium. Okay. That's the barrel of the cylinder stove. The end plates, and actually the end plates aren't made in the United States. They're titanium dinner plates. Um, that's one of the, and we don't sell the stoves to the military, so that's one thing we don't make here. Okay. Um, and that, this titanium here, it's actually made, it's, it's you know, spirit of full candor, that's an Asian, titanium because that's about can the you even you find it can you even get that material in the, anywhere else we could but nobody would buy the stove um, oh okay. it, it'd be a little pot of gold um, okay they're already expensive as hell um it it would be about a thousand bucks for oh, that stove um, dang american titan titanium from america is pretty pretty high dollar um, okay so so let me ask this why why does it have to be titanium just a weight lightweight oh Okay. That's the key. So, and we've done some pretty crazy stuff is, is we can't have on camera, but you have seen upstairs. Mm -hmm. We've pushed the outer limits of burning the building down to the ground, right? <laughs> Trying to, to get them as light as we can and everything right. else. And, and right. we've always got something coming down the pipe. The big thing, we don't rush anything. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of me freezing my ass off in the middle of the night is what it boils down to. Seeing how light, how, how small, how big, there's so much into it that we can how how low we can go and how high we can go with anything right before it goes to market but um but yeah that's the box and the cylinder stoves are what we sell right now okay so so you you referenced making it 80 degrees i, I don't know if that's like your benchmark or just a, a a reference from your years of experience but here's my question um if you're camping and it's look it's not like you or the people that buy these you know i'm sure there's some are but these are not fair weather uh, outdoor athletes. These right. are not fair weather folks. These are hard, you, hardcore. Yeah. I mean, I've seen some of your pictures. Yeah. Don't invite me there. But yeah. so how how much heat can the? I mean, that it takes a lot of heat to warm up a shelter when it's five degrees outside up to eighty. So um, how how does this stove and this material survive that? And secondly, looking from the shelters out there, how does the pipe go out the top without? melting the shelter gotcha so the first with the melting it's just the material we use that's fireproof basically okay um it's super simple it, it, it it's hard to find but actually that velcros in the hole you know and so if you do screw it up or whatever you just zip it out and velcro a new one back in um as far as like the the heat portion of it if you're in a normal tent like a two-man tent and you turn on your your uh isobutane stove to make coffee you'll feel a little bit of a heat increase in there. Well, when you have a box this big burning like it was dammed, you'd be amazed <laughs> how fast it heats up. And in the case of like, um, if you live in the, some people get worried about floorless shelters, they're gonna get wet if they're on the west side, like Washington, Oregon, BC, where the people that have actually used these, 
they use it because it's a floorless shelter and it takes a stove because you can dry all your kit out. Okay. So like you and I go on a moose hunt, you fall face first in the river, you're not happy. Are you inviting me? Exactly. Okay, when we get checking. back, you're pissed, right? You're wet. I just go in, I get the stove going, you strip down into your skivvies, there's a clothesline in the teepee, you hang it up and it's dry in an hour. Um, ah, gotcha. So, and that's keeps you alive without having to fly, drive, hike back home. Where, so going. where are we going moose hunting? I, you know what? Maybe we'll go with Jeff Lander next year. He owns Primitive Outfitting, and it, he wants to do a, a rafting trip. And okay. I'd like to see your big ass in a raft for a week floating down the river. It'd be, it'd be comical. <laughs> I can guarantee that. I can guarantee that. Look, I can talk trash all I want. I would go on that. Yeah. But, uh, no, that, I mean, it, it, it's incredible to me that, uh, that you can build something that's... The, these things just don't don't weigh much at all i mean that's ridiculous yeah. but but yet you you put that together and it can heat that i mean that's that that's just incredible so um well i think <laughs> I, th I think people wonder often uh, how does my 16 year old daughter uh, who is a girly girl too but she also how do you keep her happy how do i keep my girlfriend happy right that stove is a big part keep of it. Keep her I mean, warm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> keep them warm. And the more, you know, especially the, the happier you can be, the longer you stay. Or in the case of someone that's not used to it, the more you can make it closer to home, the better off you are. And if you're, you know, toasting marshmallows and cooking fish or whatever on your stove or, or, or have the heat source, you know, right. it's better than freezing in a bivy, right? It's right. And, and, and so is there generally a rule of thumb on, uh, you know, fire it up until the, 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 the tube or the pipe starts to glow, or do you just, do, I make it as hot as I can. I don't care if the thing gets red hot. That's my motto. I just okay. burn it literally like it was damned, like hell was in, the devil was inside. I do not like being cold. Okay. So when it's cold, I feed that thing literally like it, eating wood is its job. I'm stuffing, I'm stuffing firewood in it and it just cranks out heat and that pipe will get hotter and hotter like red higher but doesn't matter i mean i've got a stove that patrick gave me that's 14 years old and it's so it, it looks beat to shit but it's fine i mean it still works but it's taking some abuse so, nice yeah. awesome well these are these are freaking awesome things so we're gonna uh we're gonna head out of the metal shop here and uh keep on rolling we're gonna wrap things up with their slick bag. This is the uh, the Kafaru uh, nighttime keeping you warm sack. Some people call them sleeping bags, but at this level, they are they are well above that. So these things uh, don't look like the sleeping bags that I slept in when I was a kid. No, no, these are we've changed some designs on them, some materials. This one, the biggest difference people notice is there's no baffles sewn into it. Um, that's because we use a continuous fiber filament. So without having the baffles you don't lose body heat and you don't get any wind coming inside and the thing with uh using the insulation we use uh you know it's a big thing to use down or synthetic right with synthetic insulation it can get wet and it has a 97 to 98 percent heat retention value meaning it doesn't matter if it's wet you're not going to die right um the, the other cool thing about synthetic is you can get in it soaking wet and your body heat dries your clothing Oh, so, okay. like, if we ever went on one of these adventures you, you're not wanting to go on, you'll see you're me. You're going to force me to, huh? Well, <laughs> it, it, the first time Amy saw it, I stripped down to my underwear, and I'm throwing all my clothes in my bag. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to get in my bag so they dry out. And I kind of, I, I use a wide bag. I place them around me. My body heat dries them out, so the next morning I'm not putting on cold, wet clothing. Nice. So, yeah, these are a huge seller for us. And it, these are the closest... Um, the closest actual synthetic bags on the market that go pound for pound with a down bag. So if you had a 20 degree down bag, it'd probably weigh one pound for a really good one, one pound, 10 ounces to 112 or something, where our bag's like two pounds, two ounces. So they're close, they compress pretty close. So you get a lot of the advantages with this insulation of a down bag and not, not a lot of the downside. Gotcha. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely so, so it's it's been a good one for us and it's kept me alive for and so sure. right <laughs> and so what uh what temperature ratings do you guys manufacture these bags at 20 zero and negative 20 but I, we just had a guy ask me i need a negative 20 should i order a wide so i can put a whoopee in it 
to stay to negative 40. And I <laughs> replied, that sounds horrible, but yes, that's what you would <laughs> want to do. We get a lot of the military guys doing Arctic cold weather training that order the negative 20s. Okay. Um, but in, you know, in all honesty, a negative 20 is a giant bag. Um, right. So you're going to need a big backpack if you're going to go backpacking with a negative 20 you better plan ahead because that thing's going to take up some space in your, your okay pack. so so let's talk realistic numbers because when i hear you say a negative 20 bag i'm thinking if i'm ever anywhere that's negative 20 and i have to actually sleep outside yeah. <laughs> i already made a mistake yeah so give us some give us some realistic you know, expectations on what those rating, I mean, are those, those like- Those are comfort ratings. Okay. Um, and when I say that, I sleep like a, you know, seven-year-old schoolgirl. I sleep cold, I get cold. So me and a lot of my uh, weenie friends that sleep cold tested these thinking, you know, worst case scenario. So they're based off of that. So you can actually, it was 20 when we were fishing the other day and I was super hot. Um, so, but for sure, it should keep anyone warm at 20 degrees. Right. Um, you can push it one way or another. So we know, I know a lot of guys sleep down to 10 or so and, and they just wear their puffy jacket. Right. But I, they're a comfort rating and all things being equal, um, a few things make a big difference. If you warm your feet up, for example, that's where most people's cold spots right. are. I, I use the 20 degree almost all year because I'll wrap my puffy jacket around my feet and I can go down to 10 degrees in a 20 degree bag because that's the only thing that gets cold on me. The big one is my feet. Okay, so. and so how much does the 20 degree bag, I, I know you, that you guys do make them in sizes, but equal sizes, how much does the 20 degree bag weigh? Uh, so it's uh, right at two pounds for a 20 degree regular length, regular width. Right. It's two pounds, three ounces, or that's what mine weighs. That's a regular height wide. Okay. And the wide, which we're going to find out in a few minutes if it fits a wide guy because you're tall and wide, but our bags are, are definitely more generous, genuously sized than, okay. than other companies. I have a ton of room in my, my wide, and that's to, usually to slam you know, cold, wet clothing in to try right. and dry it off, so I leave a lot of room in there. And then how much more does the zero bag weigh? Oh, two pounds, 14 ounces, or three pounds, two. I can't remember. I'm going to have to bow out of this one and say, hop on kafaru.net and uh, look, because I can't remember. <laughs> there you um, go. But they go up uh, incrementally equally. Okay. I mean, it's about, about what you would think it would be, about a pound per, per level, I guess you could say. So, gotcha. All yeah. right, well, Aaron just gave you the kafaru.net, so go over there and check out all the kafaru products from the pockets, the bags, the accessories, the coats, the sleeping bags, and I'm fitting to see if I'll fit fit in one of those things, but... Uh, I'm gonna zip you up and push you over. That's generally what I do to my buddies. I'm like, let me see if this fits. I zip them up and then I push them. <laughs> awesome, I'm looking forward to that. But uh, thanks for your time today. Great job. Yeah, thanks for and, coming uh, out. And you guys keep up the good work. Thanks.